Good evening and welcome to this evening's Corporate and External Issues Scrutiny Committee being held on Monday the 14th of December 2020. I'm Councillor Richard Sylvester, the time's just after 6pm. I'm the chair of this scrutiny committee. Our uh, committee clerk this evening is Vicky Ridge and you'll hear Vicky's voice throughout the meeting as I consult with her and our technical officer is John Duckett and one of jo John's uh, roles is to move the camera around the various speakers. So I'd like to welcome our committee members, the members of the scrutiny committee, our Bolton councillors, our council officers and to members of the public if you're watching this meeting live either on the Bolton Council website or the recorded version on Bolton Council's YouTube channel. So we'll go to our agenda for this evening and item number one is declarations of interest. And if any member has a declaration to declare, please could you uh, unmute your microphone and declare that interest now. No member has unmuted the microphone, so there are no declarations of interest. Item number two is urgent business. Is there any urgent business, Vicky? There isn't no turn up that I've been notified of. Thank you. Item three is apologies for absence. Have we any apologies, Vicky? We do, yeah. I've got apologies from Councillor Fletcher and Councillor Wild. Thank you. Uh, item four is the minutes of the previous meeting. This was the meeting held on the 26th of October 2020 and we have uh, six pages of minutes. These were um, issued to members uh, before this meeting uh, by email. Uh, if any member has anything on the minutes, please unmute and let me know. We'll go through them page by page, starting at uh, D1. Uh, D2, D3. Councillor Sylvester. Yes. Councillor Mike Mulkin here. Apologies, my screen had locked, but uh, I want to take us back to the first page, i.e. attendance. Uh, on D1, that's Sorry, D1, yeah. I was, yes. in I was in attendance at this meeting. I seem to be omitted from the attendees. I remember that you was also in attendance, so we will ask Vicky to update the minutes, uh, if you can, Vicky. Thank you. Yeah, I will do, and I'll have it recorded in these minutes as well, that they were approved subject to Councillor McMill convening in attendance. Sure, thank you. Uh, so we go to page uh, D4, D5, and finally D6. So could a member of the committee move those as a correct record with the amendment that Councillor McMulkin was in attendance? I'll move that chair. Thank you. And could I have a seconder, please? I'll second, second those. Thank you very much. And uh, those uh, minutes have been moved and seconded as a correct record. Would members unmute and say aye if you agree? Aye. 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 Thank you members, those minutes have been agreed with the amendment. Item five is the committee work programme. Would you like to take us through this, uh, Vicky? There have been a couple of changes. Yeah, thanks Chair. Um, so the item on the cube, um, which we thought we would be could be coming come forward he's going to come to a special meeting um, when the final report has been produced in relation to there were some items on the work program in relation to what was felt as trading standards issues um, and we have spoken to officers in regulated services um, we haven't got really any updates on them but if um, there's further details coming forward they will be considered by the place scrutiny committee OK, and we've got an additional item uh, on tonight's uh, agenda, which is a policing update and will be joined by the police uh, at item number seven. So with that, we'll go to item number six, 
which is uh, a COVID-19 and finance update. This is a standing item throughout this uh, municipal year. And we'll go over to our Borough Treasurer and Deputy Chief Executive, Sue Johnson. Uh, Sue. Thank you, Chair. So the uh, information provided to Scrutiny this evening was submitted back into MHCLG on Friday night and it represents the situation in terms of COVID's financial impact in this financial year as at the end of November. So in total we have received £26.7 million worth of emergency government support and our latest estimate of the full year effect of additional costs, loss of income and the current figure in terms of unachieved savings currently stands at £35.5 million, but obviously that will change particularly as the savings required in our financial plan come out towards the end of this financial year. So, can I the next slide? Thank you. So, in terms of additional costs, um, the format that members are used to seeing, it, it ranges across the council. Um, and what we've also put in there is the amounts of money that we are I, I able to either recharge into the CCG because NHS are um, able to pull down some money which helps particularly in terms of social care, but also monies that um, Infection Control Grant has brought in. Public Health, um, hopefully all the additional grant money that is being received from the government on top of our emergency funding is paying for all the additional activity which is being commissioned by our public health. And then we have a share across um, the rest of the services for some additional costs. Next slide, please. So in terms of income, we know from previous meetings that this has been a particularly big impact on the council. Commercial income in particular, because of the airport dividend the non-payment of interest on loans into the council, although it's important to note on that, that we can accrue for this. So we will receive that funding from the airport before they start paying any shareholder dividends. So that is a cash flow impact and not a budgetary impact. The other really large impact, as we know, is around our business rates and council tax receipts. Now, obviously, um, there have been um, a significant value of grants going out to local businesses um, and many of our residents have been furloughed um, but we are despite that seeing an impact and we're keeping a very close eye on that because in terms of our budget we are always one year behind in terms of our collection of business rates and council tax and that impact as we see there falls into next financial year. And at this point, we believe that we'll be using about four million pounds worth of our reserves. And then for completeness, um, there is a, a variety of other grants that have been provided by the um, government. So there is just a snapshot, um, you know, over 60 million pounds worth of grants that are going out to businesses, but then also um, additional money for specific items. So, for example, track and trace. Um, support to residents with food and essentials and infection control, um, which is so vital um, in keeping safe our residents who are currently in a care home. So that is the update as at the end of November and I'll pass back to you, Chair. Thank you uh, very much indeed, Sue. Have any members got any questions for Sue? There are, there are no questions in the chat box, but uh, do unmute if you have any questions. Well, no questions at all. One has just come through from Council Peel in the chat box, so we'll go over to Council Peel. Apologies, my um, couldn't access my chat box for some reason. Uh, thanks, Chair. Um, thanks for the update, So, Can you tell us what the main um, changes are since the last update because obviously this is a constant uh, uh, moving feast uh, uh, in terms of um, I'm not particular I'm not so much interested in the, in the specific grants for mainly external use that we're getting from the government that we are hopefully spending 100 percent of uh, but uh, in terms of the uh, loss of income and the um, 
COVID related costs for the for the council itself. Um, overall figures going worse, remaining the same, getting better. Um, I think overall that the income, the loss of income is slightly better than we had predicted last time um, and that's around council tax and business rates. We have now started as a council sending out reminder letters um, to, to businesses for non-payment of invoices um, and we have seen a, a, a better position over the last couple of months as those reminders have gone out as we've started our debt collection procedures but there is a huge amount of caution around that because obviously we've got a way to go to the end of the financial year and what we don't know is the impact of obviously we you know what we're in tier three will that continue we're yet to find out there's been talks around another peak in january um and so it could go worse again but that is probably the most noticeable change that we have as of today thanks Jay. just a, just a quick follow-up um I think um, e even as even as the government are planning for a, a general free for all over Christmas, they're also planning for the related third wave as a result of that policy. So it, it just seems um, uh, just beyond words to me, really. Um, the, the other thing that I really want to chase up is um, it, it is a huge uh, amount in terms of the loss of commercial income over 13 million the bulk of which is made up of, of Manchester Airport um, income and we know that the government is refusing to uh, accept that this is um, income uh, for not only Bolton but all the other GM authorities leaving us all with a, uh, a worse problem than, than it needed to be. Um, we, we were um, updated some months ago as to the situation with Manchester Airport and updated in terms of the long-term recovery plan for Manchester Airport based on what we knew I think probably now maybe six months ago based on what was projected at that point. I understand that you may not be in a position either able to or in terms of confidentiality to update members uh, in, in this meeting now uh, Borough Treasurer but could I ask yourself and the leader uh, to perhaps bring a uh, update on the Manchester Airport situation to uh, the recovery group or, the, or indeed the cabinet because I'm just I'm just worried that it has been a long time since we first saw the um, financial consequences on the airport and I have a feeling that much of that will have changed in that we may the, the financial projection may well have been overly optimistic thinking that the country might be getting back on its feet by now. So I'll leave it there if, if I could just leave that request with you and the chief and the leader to, to bring a report to the appropriate um, body. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, uh, Councillor Peel. Do you want to come back at all, Sue? You're OK. So we'll go over now to uh, Councillor Heslop. He has a question as well. So we'll go over to Kersley and Councillor Heslop. Um, the, the line's bad. Uh, hopefully you can hear me. We can hear um, you, yes. So can, can you just um, clarify what uh, the, the amount of the deficit that's attributable to COVID and the amount of the deficits attrib attributable to um, the, the council's finances that's perhaps carried forward from last year, our savings? I'm just wondering about the split exactly how much is due to covid and this the reason i'm going there is because this is something that will hopefully go to central government and say listen if it wasn't for covid we wouldn't have this deficit of and and can't you could you give me those figures Did you hear that? Sorry? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've just gone live. So yeah, I mean obviously the presentation tonight is is solely around covid. I think what you're asking about is the thirty-nine and a half million pounds worth of cuts proposals that are currently out for consultation. So if that's what the question is, um, about ten and a half million pounds is attributable to the ongoing impact of COVID. 
The rest of it is savings carried forward from our previous two year strategy and the significant increase for demand for council services that we have been managing through reallocating reserves. Now we're in a position that those reserves are no longer available because we spent them. So we have having to build them into the budget on an ongoing basis. But in terms of that 39 and a half million, it's about 10 and a half, which is the ongoing impact of COVID. Thank you, Chair. Thanks for that, Sue. Thank you very much, uh, Councillor Heslop. Uh, thank you to Sue for answering those questions. And we'll go to item seven now, which is a policing update. And I'm very pleased that this evening we're joined uh, verbally by telephone uh, by the police. And can we go over to Stuart Ellison and Rick Jackson, who'll give us a policing update? Yeah, thank you, Chair. Good evening. Stuart Ellison here, the Chief Superintendent for GMP, responsible for Wigan, Bolton and Berry as a combined command area. Uh, Rick is also with me as the commander for Bolton specifically. So um, as you would hope, we've, we've, uh, we have put our heads together and put together a structured input for you tonight, which I'll give a, a brief oversight, first of all, around some of the demand that we face in Bolton on a yearly basis and then invite Rick in to talk about some of the local initiatives that have taken place with and some of the successes from the past year. Uh, we are also going to talk specifically around um, serious violent crime, roads policing and serious organised crime, which are some of the issues we've been asked to talk about in particular. Um, apologies for having to dial in tonight. It's not ideal. We did anticipate joining you with on Teams, but it would appear that the version of Teams being used isn't compatible with our IT in the GMP offices, so we've had to resort to the telephone. Um, hopefully that will, will still suffice, but as Rick said earlier, it means we can't see hands getting raised. So perhaps if we uh, get through the presentation and then, uh, Chair, if we can go through you for any questions that come our way. Uh, yes, we'll, we'll do that because I, I can see who's indicated and we've got two, uh, two questions from Council Hayes, but we'll wait till you've got through the presentation. It sounds very interesting and thank you for joining us this evening. So uh, please go ahead. OK, as I say, my role is the Territorial Commander of Wigan, Bolton and Berry, and uh, we're here to talk about Bolton in particular tonight. But um, just as a bit of background before we, we go into some of the detail, what I would say is in GM terms, Bolton is now one of the busiest policing districts that we have in Greater Manchester area. Um, and some of that is around supporting a population of, of as we all know, 280,000 people, 54 square, square miles, and what is now one of the largest towns in the UK. So that brings us some specific policing challenges in terms of local demand. Um, but we've had a lot of success over the last year in terms of getting support from our chief officer team to start to slowly increase the establishment for the, the policing team here in Bolton. And we started to see some numbers come through in the student officers that have joined us in the last six months, which is really positive. Um, and positive in terms of the recognition from the wider Greater Manchester Police for the, the demand that, um, that Bolton offers and the, the, the public service that we want to deliver here. So um, some of the snapshots as a, as a background before I invite Rick in. Uh, Bolton as a policing district in the last year has responded to nearly 81,500 police incidents. And that's a really significant number. Um, what that means is that our policing team here, we know, have been responding to more incidents per head of staff than elsewhere in Greater Manchester Police. Uh, and I don't offer that point lightly. Um, it's not just numbers, but a lot of our team here are actually residents of Bolton as well. And there's a genuine passion for policing Bolton amongst the policing team here. Um, 81,500 incidents isn't something that we face lightly. Um, it's not um, a demand that we can evenly spread out across the 365 days of the year, unfortunately, as, as much as that would be ideal for us. And it brings spikes in demand for reasons that you'll understand, whether that's a Saturday night or a critical incident. Um, and, you know, our, our staff come under pressure at different times of, of the, the, the year, really, in terms of seasonality. But the 81,500 incidents that we've attended in the last year, they range from the 999 emergency Moscow Now calls to scheduled calls where it's been more appropriate for a victim that we turn up um, and support an appointment that's been agreed at their convenience. Um, it's generated from within that uh, about 4,200 incidents that have been purely COVID related since March. And that's brought a, a different dynamic to policing of the borough than, than we've ever seen in previous years. And from the 81,500 incidents, we've recorded over 28,000 crimes now, not all the crimes are suitable or appropriate to be investigated, 
but it means at any one time we typically have about um, three and a half thousand open crimes under investigation amongst the policing team here in Bolton alone. And the top five crime types that we typically see under investigation will be um, incidents of violence, public order, stalking and harassment and criminal damage, and also some vehicle offences. But just to give you some context before I invite Rick in, the last year has seen us have some real successes in terms of um, geographical policing and targeting some of our, our spikes in, in, in crime types that we see. And that's been driven largely through Rick's uh, tasking and coordinating group that's also attended by partners. Uh, snapshots here, we've seen burglaries across the borough come down 33% in the last year against the previous year. Reports of robbery are down 50% on the previous year. Vehicle related crimes down 11%. And reports of violence with injury are down 14%. Now, the, the nature of crime that we're facing is changing every year. And the, the, I mean, in all honesty, the old uh, Dixon of Doc Green type uh, situation where visible cops on the corner are going to tackle everything are, are, is not the world that we now exist in. And a lot of our crime is split into three key areas really. We've got crimes that remain in the public domain that might be related to the nighttime economy, the might around vehicle offences, it's the kind of thing that's high profile and seen by the public. But a, an increasing percentage of our crime takes place in the private place. And we're talking there about crimes such as domestic abuse, uh, child abuse, things, crimes that take place behind um, closed door. But we've also got in the mix here, crimes that take place in what we would call the virtual arena. And there's more and more crime being recorded that's taking place online whether that's fraud, whether that's uh, social media related, trolling, uh, grooming, those kind of offences. So a lot of it is actually unseen to the public. And also in the mix within all that, we've got a really effective um, Operation Challenger team, as we call it here, that's tackling organised crime in the borough. Um, Rick will go into more detail, but we've had nine really successful crime operations this year with the Challenger team. All nine have been tackling really significant organised crime groups and dismantling them all nine have got prosecutions pending that relate to uh, violence, drug use and drug supply. Uh, and that, that challenge team, importantly, is not just police related. It's, it's dominated by the police, but it's also working in partnership with the local authority. So our team here are actually got a lot to be proud of in the last year. COVID has brought its own challenges to policing for reasons that you would all understand and expect. Um, but there is that, that the perception perhaps that the police have been somehow immune to COVID and we've been all singing, all dancing right through uh, every day, every 24 hour period since March. And that's not the case. We've, um, we have our own teams that are uh, impacted upon by the need to social isolate uh, uh, or social distance through test and trace requirements. And we've had some challenging times over the last six months where we have lost the best part of, for example, a whole response team or a CID relief. And we've had to manage our resources appropriately to make sure we continue to deliver the level of service that we aspire to deliver in Bolton. So there's an awful lot of really good stuff going on on a very, very busy policing district. Um, and perhaps on that note, a good time to hand over to Rick to go into some of the, the local detail um, specific to the borough in the last year. Rick? Thanks, Stuart. I think it helps if I just set some context uh, around the priorities for Bolton. Uh, I think when people have a mind's eye view of what the police do, they perhaps don't always consider all the uh, all the offences that go on um, behind closed doors or online that Stuart's already alluded to. But just to give a clear outline of the priorities for Bolton, it's around firstly protecting vulnerable people, so that will include domestic abuse, rape, serious sexual offences, child sexual exploitation, child criminal exploitation and hate crime. Um, the second is of course to counter the threat of organised crime, which again is something that's very much unseen but hugely impacts the communities. And thirdly, acquisitive crime, which covers a whole range of issues, some of which people feel very directly in the form of burglary, others which have uh, really uh, pernicious impacts on communities that aren't as well seen. So I'd really like to emphasise the fact that many of the high harm offences and incidents are those that are hidden from the public in the in the main. It's not the sort of crime that they personally encounter despite the effect nevertheless having such a huge detrimental impact on communities. You know, so when you compare and contrast that with the likes of antisocial behaviour, speeding and serious disorder, as serious as they are, the, the ones that have been alluding to just aren't as visible but nevertheless are very necessary to be uh, tackled in, in the manner that we do. So, 
And just to give you a flavour of what that looks like, uh, in the last 12 months, we've executed over 45 what we call Messina warrants. These are the warrants relating to the suspects that are downloading uh, child pornography. Uh, we've had in excess of 300 rapes reported in the last year, and at any one time we'll be investigating over 220 uh, rapes. We've had in excess of 400 serious sexual offences this last year. Uh, and again, just to give some context, we've had nearly uh, 250 Section 18 woundings, and this is the most serious level of assault before you move on to murder. We have uh, 30 child exploitation cases open with our partners, uh, where we're working with children and families at the highest risk of sexual and criminal exploitation. We've had examples of cases linking country lines in Derbyshire, London and Hull in this last 12 months. Uh, we've got one long-standing uh, child sexual exploitation operation ongoing where we've got 20 plus crimes for rape and serious sexual assault of, um, of juveniles, 14 victims, 10 offenders. I can't emphasise what an enormous piece of work that is and the amount of resource that needs to be put into it to successfully bring that home at court and give the, the victims the support that they need. When you look at serious and organised crime, we've currently got eight serious uh, and organised crime investigations ongoing. And again, I, I'd emphasise that these are the mid to upper tier uh, groups that effectively coerce the next generation uh, into uh, the, the lower tiers of criminal uh, activity so it's incredibly important that we address it at the right level and use our resources efficiently because if we put our resources in at too low a level uh, we, we're just not strangling the the organized crime teams at the right level we, and we're not giving the service that we need to to members of the public we've dismantled this last 12 month uh, 12 months the threat that's emanated from uh, an organized crime group or a combination of several that operated in the Castle Street area. And I have to say this has been a multi-generational threat that's had a significant impact on those living in and around those communities for some significant time. So that's a real uh, success in my view. And that's certainly the feedback we've had from communities. We've dismantled a really significant uh, organized crime group that have been dealing drugs in Halliwell and Dean. It's the very same group that has been linked to the most recent shooting of what transpired to be a criminal associate. Uh, from that, we've arrested nine. Three have been charged and remanded, uh, the victim actually being one of them, who's pleaded guilty to a fray in possession of offensive weapons and sentenced to uh, time in prison. Uh, the others are still awaiting trial on that. We've executed seven warrants on uh, uh, one of our local sites, uh, linked to multiple crimes throughout Bolton and, and beyond, throughout Lancashire and uh, Greater Manchester as well, where we've recovered multiple stolen vehicles, caravans, shotguns, ammunition, petrol bombs, uh, large quantities of cash and drugs. Just to give you some context around some of our financial investigations, we've had cash seized and forfeitures to the tune of over £1 million in confiscation orders, uh, over £600,000 in cash forfeitures. We've currently got an additional £400,000 going through the courts as we speak, and the financial investigator has got over 80 active investigations. So there's a really large piece of work there, again, in an area of policing, which is very rarely seen or encountered by members of the public. In terms of serious violent crime, uh, we've dismantled and prosecuted uh, a town centre robbery team under the, uh, the name Op Barter, where we've had 24 offenders that are suspected to have committed over 200 knife point robberies in and around the area. Uh, we've detected over 100 of those offences with 14 nominals or rather suspects charged with offences, a further 10 uh, with multiple files waiting with CPS for decisions. We've had seven of them plead guilty so far, but the net result is, as, uh, as per that statistic Stuart's already given, uh, we've had a 50% reduction in robberies in Bolton, and I would suggest that that has played no small part in, in that reduction. And again, just to give a flavour of some of the unseen work that happens on a day-to-day -day basis, uh, we have a significant amount of demand in the form of missing persons. 
And whilst each missing person represents a huge tragedy and one that rarely comes to the attention of the public, uh, there are also some of our most vulnerable people in society that go missing. But just to move it away from um, the vulnerability and the impact on individuals and just put some cold hard statistics on it, that equates to best part of £2,400 per investigation when you actually cost it. So between September 19 and October 2020, uh, sorry, October 2020, we've had uh, over 3,800 missing persons. And again, just to give context, that equates to over £9 million pounds in costs. We, we do, unfortunately, have a very high level of domestic abuse uh, in Bolton, with nearly 5,000 incidents reported this last year. And that, that's a level of demand that um, our partners share with us. So that has a tremendous impact on children's services, on the various charities that support us, uh, and unfortunately represents one of the highest levels of demand in GMP outside of the three combined districts that form the city of Manchester. Again, just giving you some skills. But um, I, I could carry on talking about the, the unseen side of it, but I, I do know there's an awful lot of public concern with regards to uh, what's currently going on, especially with regards to roads policing. So I think uh, at this point, I'll hand back to Stuart, who will just give you an overview of some of the work that's ongoing there. Yeah, th thanks, Rick. Um, yeah, Chair, as I mentioned at the beginning, roads policing is worth a specific mention at the moment. Um, and I think this has come more to the fore um, during lockdown. You know, the Chief Constable spoke very openly uh, early in the summer about how some of the roads of Greater Manchester had become racetrack effectively and the behaviours of people had changed with the, uh, the quieter roads. Now, as a borough in Bolton, we do have some significant challenges around some of the fast roads across the borough. And that's not specific just to, to COVID, but um, we see that some of the, um, the speed on the fast roads and the behaviour of drivers representing a real challenge and a, and, a, and a genuine threat to the safety of other, other road users. Um, year to date, uh, there have been nine what we call KSI, which is killed or serious injury road traffic collisions that have resulted in um, fatalities, which is awful. You know, any, any one is far too high, but nine year to date and we had seven last year across the borough. So we're slightly up on last year. Um, what I would say is in terms of fatalities, that absolutely isn't a numbers game. I just offer that as a uh, to offer context really because clearly any fatality is, is awful. Um, just to reassure the committee, we get more support as a policing district in, in um, Bolton uh, from our central safer transport team, uh, which is a very grand title. Uh, you might recognise them all as traffic officers, but um, we get more support here as a district than any other district uh, and any of the nine other boroughs across Greater Manchester. Um, Within that, we have identified through their, with their support 29 specific speeding hotspots. Hot spots. And in the last year, there's been active and very proactive enforcement activity taking place, uh, all of them, uh, across 50 dedicated speeding operations. Uh, now, you know, clearly we haven't got the capacity to cover all of those hotspots um, every night or every week of the year, but all of them, all 27, have had speeding operations taking place um, pretty much every week of the year. And on top of that, we've also brought in traffic PCSOs who are, differ slightly to the PCSOs that you will see on your own communities. They are, they are traffic specialists, but they've come in and they've um, actually secured 834 speed gun prosecutions across the borough of Bolton uh, on our behalf in the last year as well. Now, I'm going to ask Rick to come in in a minute to talk about Operation Portman, which is how we are complementing the support of our centralised colleagues with, with local activity. But I, I, don't, I think it's important to, to highlight as well that there's a real link to the OCG, the organised crime groups, some of the behaviours that they demonstrate in the antisocial um, anti social use of vehicles. Um, and that plays out in some of the behaviours that we've seen on the faster roads around Bolton. Um, the other thing to note, of course, with, in relation to roads policing is that enforcement is just one strand of the solution here. Um, there are other activities that need to take place around education, around de perhaps designing the risk out of some of those faster roads. But we've really applied ourselves locally. Rick's going to talk about Operation Portman in a second, but the support we're getting from our centralised traffic unit is, is something that we're very grateful for locally. Um, and it's bringing us a, a, an awful lot of results. 
Uh, and I, as I say, I, there's, there's very much a feeling here that, that the nine KSI fatalities that we've, we've seen this year, well, it's nine too many in all honesty, but there is, a, there is a, certainly a challenge on some of the faster roads on the borough. So, Rick, if you can just outline perhaps Operation Portman and how that's complementing the work that our centralised traffic unit are, are doing for us. Thanks, Stuart, yeah. So, Op Portman comes on the back of two other, uh, what I would suggest are successful joint operations through uh, October and November in support of our central services. Uh, so, Op Portman is an operation where we've trained up a number of neighbourhood officers uh, to use handheld speeding devices. These are officers that wouldn't otherwise be enforcing traffic initiatives that'd be uh, ensconced into more day-to-day -day, um, neighbourhood issues um, as opposed to traffic policing, but such is the level of concern, we've reprofiled some of those officers to address some of those concerns head on. Um, this has resulted in uh, some quite uh, significant uh, enforcement. So we've had over 630 speeding offences, um, that have come about uh, in a, a mixture of roadside stops and static cameras. Uh, 97 are, are roadside stops, we've had seven arrests, five drink drivers, one of the, which was a prison recall, one arrested for dangerous driving, we've had stolen vehicles recovered, uh, we've had a further five vehicles seized under legislation around uh, insurance um, and multiple other, other offences that have been detected as a consequence, many of which have actually linked back to uh, acquisitive crime, burglars, robberies, etc. Uh, because unfortunately you do find that there, there generally is some crossover. But that operation uh, has started some time ago, it's going to continue through until the new year. We're going to continue putting pressure um, on uh, our own staff and partners to really uh, go big on some of the messages we get out to public. It's not just about enforcement, as Stuart's already said. We really do need to educate people, and I think that's where we really do need to turn to our partners and wider community to support us in getting those messages out there and making people understand what is and isn't acceptable. But I'd suggest that the, the level of policing that's been um, directed towards this, we're beginning to get some of those messages home, I would like to think. So um, I think, Chair, at this point, uh, there's nothing further from myself. Uh, I don't know if you want to take any questions or direct them to us. Uh, yes, there are several uh, questions. Um, councillors have uh, indicated in the chat box that they do wish to ask some questions. We'll be going over to Councillor Hayes first, who has two questions to ask. So if we could go over to Smiddles and to Councillor Hayes. Thank you, Chair. Um, a little bit more than the two questions, actually, if you don't mind. That's can perfectly I, fine. Can I thank the officers for a very informative presentation? It does, I think, highlight what the variety of problems the police are having. Uh, in fact, you've you've had a, at a time when, until recently at least, numbers have been reducing. You've had increasing complexities of crime. Some of the financial crime must be extremely difficult to deal with, but. Um, I couldn't help chuckling a bit of the fact you're having IT difficulties uh, initially on Teams, but you, you've had IT difficulties with your system for a long time, haven't you? Uh, so the first question really is, how are you getting on with that now? Have we actually beginning to get over the, the IT problems that seem to be causing a lot of difficulties? Um, in short, Councillor, um, yes, we are getting over them. We, we brought in... Um, a significant new command and control and um, uh, management system process uh, what, July 19, so we're, we're nearly 18 months on now. I think it's well documented in the media that we had some, some really significant problems on go live uh, in terms of um, using the system and the, the various updates that were required to bring the system to where it needs to, to be. We've had updates coming in throughout the 18 month period and the staff have got more comfortable with it. Some of the glitches that we see, we saw in it in terms of the um, capability and the gaps have been closed. Uh, there is still work ongoing, but uh, in short, yeah, IOPS has um, improved significantly in the last 18 months. Um, I I'm probably worth pointing out actually that the, the problem getting onto um, Microsoft Teams tonight is not IOPS related. 
Um, <laughs> oh, yeah. that, that's down to uh, the Windows 10 server, and we're currently moving the force to completely from a mix of Windows 10 and Windows 7 to all Windows 10. And once that's, that works complete in the new year, then there'll be no problem with any version of Microsoft Teams. We're just kind of in that transition period. Thank you. I, I did realise it was nothing to do with IOPS, but I couldn't uh, resist the comment. Um, the other thing really is on police numbers. You probably expected me to talk more about speed, uh, but I'll give that a rest for tonight. Um, where are we with the increase in police numbers? I mean, I've heard, uh, I mean, I'm, we know it's, a, it's an ever changing feast. A lot of officers are retiring, leaving the force, uh, and it's not just simply that you get extra officers. Every thousand that you recruit, presumably it will be a lot less than a thousand effective increase. So where are we both in Greater Manchester as a whole and in specifically in Man in Bolton now with numbers? Are we up? Uh, we are. We are up. Um, yeah, the, the 20,000 extra officers that's been promised by central government actually means something in the region of just over 600 for Greater Manchester, but that's over a two year period. And you're absolutely right. It's not as simple as the next kind of uh, 600 that come in are all a plus. We've also got to cater for natural turnover of staff and retirements and what have you. So our recruitment and our training teams are, well, to say they're working at capacity would do a disservice, to be honest. Um, we are recruiting heavily at the moment. Recruitment is, is open and the training team are working really hard to, to get us the new student officers in line um, and, and to the front line as fast as we can. To give you a little bit of context, of our um, frontline staff at Bolton in the last year, we've brought in 129 new student officers, so that's brand new recruits on top of the existing establishment, which has been fantastic. But we have, of course, lost some through natural wastage on the way through as well. So from a Bolton specific point of view, our establishment has grown. We've had, for example, a commitment from uh, chief officers to increase the numbers of our, what you might recognise as response officers, the, the, the frontline uh, patrol officers. And we had an extra 20 or so uh, cops that have come through uh, through that uplift. So uh, we are starting to get our share of the, the 600 extra officers that come into Greater Manchester over a two year period. Not massive numbers because of the natural wastage. It's, it's a slow process and there's no kind of big bang with it. But we, we should see some more numbers coming in over the next 18 months. And pre presumably it does take a while for them to become fully effective. I mean, a, a, an experienced officer is worth an awful lot. And you can't build that into a new officer very quickly, I assume. No, that's right. And, and there is a, there is a um, just to give you some more context there, there is a national problem actually recruiting uh, police officers to become detectives. So there's a whole host of reasons behind that. But of course, um, we had a five year gap where we weren't recruiting at all because we were downsizing through austerity. And typically those officers that might have come through that five year period and been ready to specialise, whether it was detectives or traffic officers or looking to take the sergeant's exam. Of course, because we didn't recruit for five years, we had a significant gap where that generation, if you like, just weren't there. So we are now working through the back end of that and we're starting to see officers coming through with the right service to start thinking about specialising. But yeah, you're absolutely right. There was, there was a significant gap there that um, sadly we've just got to grind out and, uh, and give it some time with the, the investment that's coming through with the new officers. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you, Councillor Hayes. We'll go over to Councillor Peel now. <clears throat> Thank you, Chair. Um, and, and thanks again for the uh, presentation uh, to our two officers. Um, it, it is uh, very reassuring to see so much going on and, and I think uh, everybody does appreciate that a lot of the policing work are things that, as was rightly said, behind closed doors, things that we're not necessarily in, in the public eye. You gave us quite a, a, a bit of a, a list of things to do. I, I would add on to that the recent um, uh, Operation um, do, 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 Operation Sector with about knife crime that, that was carried out, um, including Bolton recently. That, that's something I want to go on to with our next presentation. And also, I'd like to take this opportunity to just to thank the police, because I think um, I think during uh, COVID, people um, forget the uh, enormous amounts of um, uh, additional um, um, resourcing and, and policing that was needed from the police in order to enforce the myriad of 
various um, restrictions and regulations and to reassure people. So big thanks for all of that. Um, I, unlike Councillor Hayes, I will mention that speeding cars. Um, there's a bit of a spat in the Bolton News today where um, a couple of councillors are arguing about uh, 20 mile an hour zones. Are they worth it or not? I mean, I would, I would argue that I would agree with what was said earlier on in that it's not just about enforcement, it is about education and 20 mile an hour zones assist with uh, assist with the message, assist with the education. Enforcement does need to happen, which brings me on to um, a bit of a bugbear of mine, community speed watch initiatives. We've had a trial uh, taking part in my ward in Bolton, uh, luckily um, led by serving police officers, so we're in a very privileged position there, but I've been making inquiries about the rollout of Community Speed Watch, which I think will go a long way to assisting what the police does. And, and I am definitely picking up what can only be described as bureaucratic blockages within GM Police uh, that's preventing this from rolling out. There's no particular financial issues. Uh, there's certainly not an issue of the, of the absence of volunteers. Um, I don't know what your views are on, on that comment is, but obviously any assistance that you can give us to unblocking those blockages will be greatly appreciated. And I am I am in correspondence with Beverly Hughes about it at the moment to see to see if we can unblock that. And the second one is uh, in terms of um, general general policing issues. And by coincidence, I just dealt with a case today whereby uh, a woman uh, and a partner had to flee a house uh, because of um, threats of uh, threats of violence made by a neighbour, and the police advised her to leave the property uh, and not go back to the property, but still haven't been to speak with the neighbour who's made the threats of violence and threat, threats to kill. And I mean, we can all hear anecdotes like that, but in my, I must admit that that's probably one of the most serious. Um, anecdotes I've heard for, for a long time uh, and it does worry me that that may well be resource related that the police were unable to attend and even, even interview uh, the alleged perpetrator you know never mind telling the victim not to go home um, so I appreciate your comments on that as, as, as much as uh, you are able thanks chair thanks councillor Peel um, we'll go back over to Stuart, please. Yeah, I'll, I'll come in on Community Speed Watch and then perhaps just hand over to Rick for the, the query about general policing. Uh, I, you know, I don't know, Rick will be uh, as keen to stress we can't get into an individual case perhaps, but um, he might be able to offer some reassurance and, and get some contact with Council Appeal to talk it through um, away from the, the scrutiny committee. But on the subject of Community Speed Watch, um, Community Speed Watch is a really valuable tool. It uh, has been for a long time and, it, and it's, it's really useful to bring members of the community and volunteers out with police support to, to drive some local enforcement. It's great for public confidence. It has great results. Um, I think there's a couple of things in the mix uh, in the last few months, really. And I'm not sure, Councillor, what the bureaucratic blockages it is you're referring to. But in, in a broader sense, Community Speed Watch is great. Um, I think you need to be alive to the fact that Community Speed Watch can only offer warnings to drivers. Uh, through the post and it can't actually engage in, in uh, enforcement as you might recognise it. But that, that said, warnings are often enough to, to change behaviours, uh, certainly in the reasonable people. Um, we don't have a shortage of volunteers, absolutely right. Uh, what we have had a, an issue with, of course, is COVID and the need for social distancing over the last few months. So it hasn't been possible to bring groups of volunteers together to, to undertake community speed watch schemes. Uh, and that has been a problem for us and you know, hopefully as we get towards the spring we'll be able to all collectively move past that. Um, the only other issue I, I think in terms of a blocker with Community Speed Watch is he's having the right kit. You, know, you have to have the latest generation of uh, calibrated, legally recognised speed gun um, to undertake a Community Speed Watch. And um, there is a shortage of the latest uh, true laser speed gun uh, that we, 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 we have. Now we we do have access to one here and we, we, we uh, share one with um, colleagues in Bury, um, and we are um, trying to get the funding to get additional kit so that we can put them out uh, more routinely both for enforcement with police officers and for community speed watch as we emerge from Covid in the spring. 
Um, that might be the bureaucratic delay that's been fed back to you because that, that paper is taking a little while to work its way through the system, but it is progressing. Um, and if there's anything more about the bureaucratic blockage, I'm, I'm happy to take uh, an inquiry away or a separate conversation and take it from there. But we are we are broadly very supportive of Community Speedwatch. Great, really good tactical option, but at the right time in the right place. And COVID has COVID has been a, a blocker to that for us. Um, on the general policing point, perhaps do, do you want to come in on that, Rick? Yeah, uh, of course. Yeah, uh, as Stuart said, it is difficult to uh, to pass comment on a specific incident I uh, would be very happy to uh, to take details after after the scrutiny committee and follow it up but um, all I would say is I'd just draw you back to uh, the number of incidents we get per annum the 81 plus thousand per annum and I've just got another screen up in front of me as we're speaking and what I can tell you is uh, for every one officer I've got available to attend an incident I've got three to four live incidents as we speak so that it's very difficult to get the prioritisation right. We've got to make sure that we hit those calls where there's the most harm uh, or potential harm to individuals uh, first, of course, uh, which means that sometimes we don't give the level of service we, we would, of course, wish to. Um, we, we, so I, I can speak to you specifically about that incident um, afterwards, uh, if I may, but um, it, it, you're quite right, it will be a resource and issue. OK, thank you for that. We'll just go over now to uh, Councillor Nadeem Muslim, who's the uh, Cabinet member um, who has responsibility over um, community speed watch issues. And he just wants to um, intervene and speak about uh, community speed watch as well. Thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you as well, uh, Stuart and Rick, uh, for coming tonight. Uh, great to have you again. I know we, we spoke um, along with uh, Cabinet colleagues um, earlier, uh, about a couple of weeks ago now, uh, so appreciate you making time for us again tonight. I just wanted to comment on Community Speedwatch because I know this is an, uh, you know, it's a personal priority for me um, as the Executive Member for Stronger Communities, and um, I know many of my Council colleagues as well um, do feel feel the same and, and want to see it rolled out and Councillor Peel is right to say that you know that there's been trials in his area um, with Community Speed Watch. Um, I was fortunate to have one uh, in my ward to see it firsthand and I, I think it is really vital and I think it really does um, go mm -hmm. to giving some public confidence to um, to to see that actually things are, are happening in their um, in their area and that's actually been one of the great things about Operation Portman as well. Um, what I would say is that uh, whilst I was surprised actually not to have a, a question from Councillor Hayes on it uh, at full council um, recently, uh, I know he does like to, to ask and rightly so, um, but I'm keen to make sure that we are progressing this as much as we can in partnership with, with GMP. Um, I think there's a um, there's a way that we're sort of trying to make sure that it, it is effective rather than just you know necessarily having people standing there and 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 observing speeding traffic but you know little outcome off the back of that um it's not really something that we, we, we we're looking for we're wanting to have some sort of meaningful action off that whether that is you know warnings or you know whether that's something more serious in terms of you know prosecution for traffic offenses um yet to be determined but i know that um, you know, um, Raphael Martinez, um, who will be doing a presentation later, um, Head of Community Safety here at the Council, um, has put in a lot of work um, on the Council side to make something um, viable um, go forward. Um, and I know that it, it's been worked up, as, as Stuart mentioned as well, um, at GMP. Um, I'm personally looking to arrange a meeting uh, with relevant Chief Inspectors who are sort of dealing with the, the speed watch issue um, at GMP. Um, so hopefully within a, a few weeks, I'll be able to have that meeting and put the points across um, that, you know, not only do I feel are important about community speed watch, but also I know uh, colleagues in the Council feel are important as well. Um, but I just want to give you that assurance then to the members of the committee, really, that you know, um, we are looking at doing all we can to work with GMP um, to make this a bit of a reality for Bolton. Um, and as I say, it's a personal priority for me, um, and I can show you I will do all I can uh, to make it to make it happen um, sooner rather than later. Thanks, Chair. Thank you, uh, Councillor Muslim. We're going to go back to Councillor Peel, and uh, do you want to follow up on Community Speed Watch, uh, <laughs> Councillor Peel? I pre appreciate that, Chair. Um, just rather than 
flitting back to, to the subject, we may as well just, just bottom this one. Can, can I just say, um, first of all, to Rick, thank you very much for the offer uh, to escalate that. I will, <coughs> I, I will, I will follow the information um, on the case I mentioned uh, to you. Um, to, to, and, and I know that on back on Community Speedwatch, there is cross-party support for this. We do have a resolution at, at Council, uh, which um, I fully hope um, uh, will be withdrawn um, before it, it, it it, it reaches um, the uh, the order paper because I hope that we'll we will have resolved it by then. But just for the benefit of, of Rick and and Stuart, uh, the bureaucratic boxes. I'll just read out what came from the uh, the policing manager, uh, Mr. Bird, on on um, the the reasons of GMP concern. Um, the resource availability to recruit, induct, train, implement, and manage speed watch schemes as Speedwatch members would be recruited and inducted as formal police support volunteers. And number two, GMP cannot guarantee the health and safety of volunteers. Now, my um, correspondence with um, with uh, the uh, Deputy Mayor Beverly Hughes was, these are not insurmountable problems. These are things uh, with a bit of imagination and a small amount of, of capital resourcing, often coming from members' delegated budgets, can be resolved quite easily. Um, I don't think these are these are big issues. So I may have unfairly uh, stated them as bureaucratic blockages, but they are nevertheless blockages. Thanks, Chair. Thanks, Councillor Peel. And you you did mention previously, Councillor Peel, about uh, knife crime and Operation Scepter. Did you want to ask some questions on on that operation? Not particularly at this stage, Chair. Um, okay. It is uh, sorry. It is down on the on the work agenda um, as uh, for the uh, community safety presentation. I was merely congratulating the police on leading on that. Thank you. Okay. Well, I, I, could I ask the officers if you could um, uh, tell us a, a bit more about Operation Scepter? And uh, I know it was a Greater Manchester-wide operation, but could you um, give us some details about uh, what what occurred in Bolton? Uh, during that operation at all? I can, yeah. It's obviously changed significantly uh, throughout the course of it uh, being uh, an, an ongoing operation. Of course, before lockdown, uh, it looked somewhat different in terms of how we manage the nighttime economy, how we work with partners, um, licensed premises, etc. Um, and then, of course, we've got the, the other side of it, uh, which, again, isn't visible. We've been working behind the scenes uh, covertly to take out some of the uh, teams that we believed to be responsible for knife crime. Uh, that has, as I've mentioned before, yielded quite a, uh, a successful outcome in so much as the knife point robberies are down by 50%. Um, the, there's an awful lot more activity that's uh, happened than that, that's uh, been happening in the schools, again, going back some months. Uh, when we're able to work more easily with some of our partners in terms of just getting messages across, uh, giving inputs, etc. Um, I have to say it's been much wider than the police. Uh, there's been a lot of support from uh, the Community Safety Partnership and the wider partnership in implementing a, a number of programmes, um, but um, they are wide and varied and uh, I'd struggle actually giving you the full outline of the the work that's been done right at this moment in time, just because it has been so wide and varied and it's changed considerably over uh, the month that it's been running. But the op sector, whilst it was a force wide initiative, um, the, it was very much local resources in Bolton uh, reacting to um, the strategy set at force level, if that makes sense. OK, thank you uh, for that, Rick. And we're going to go over to Councillor Cunningham now. So, uh, Councillor Cunningham, please. Thank you, Chair. Uh, and thank you, uh, Stuart and Rick. It's uh, a very complex report you've had to put together. Uh, um, you've covered so many, uh, so many facets in it uh, for us tonight. I wonder, I mean, we've all heard and we always hear about the negative stuff and sort of um, you know, cases that are that are not investigated are, are dropped. Um, I think 80,000 was referred to by the inspector for the for Constabulary in Greater Manchester. But we also realise, particularly in light of the things you've told us there, the actual weight of um, a requirement on, on officers, both within GMP and uh, locally here in Bolton. But 
within the 80 odd thousand that were dropped or whatever i presume i'd like to know roughly what if we do know what percentage of those are actual numbers numbers of thousands perhaps related to bolton and what is it that you're having to do uh, obviously you've got choices to make uh, and you've only got resources that will spread so far what is it that you're having to drop um perhaps i presume you've some pattern or some trend of certain things you're, you're having to drop uh, in order to provide the resources you need elsewhere uh, and other things that you're having to do that you perhaps wouldn't necessarily like to do uh, but are, are doing them for you know but because the political hot potatoes or whatever but you feel really it's stopping you providing resource onto we've heard a lot about domestic violence and knife crime and all sorts of things there i know that the speed awareness that has been referred to whilst it's important uh, and, and it's you know it's good to give people a reminder and educate obviously you've got the the, the current situation where we've got officers uh, perhaps carrying out the speed the speed uh, watch things that not with the community but officers the the self i know they were doing it in in um bolton and and farmouth and kersley last weekend uh, but i did notice some some groups of of, of uh, officers stopping cars on fast roads at perhaps 10 o'clock at night when there's only one car every now and again and I, and I wondered if you've got the level of domestic violence of things going on uh, and you're picking main roads to deliver this on where you're only going to get one or two cars perhaps they may be going too fast but on big roads um, whether it might be a good idea to perhaps put them into smaller you know onto the housing estates rather than the major roads because you get a lot of the anti-social behavior people in uh, driving cars whizzing down the the, the 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 small roads where houses are where you have much more chances of uh, of causing an accident and also it would put perhaps put officers in a location where they might come over other crime as well um you know i've asked you quite a few questions there just pick out what you can out of it but looking to start with what can you not deliver um and, and what do you have to deliver that you'd rather not do so that you could put your resources out if, if, perhaps council if i come in and just put, take those back to front um to start with um but all your points are good ones i mean the stopping cars on the fast roads we are we don't just put our own dedicated regular resources onto the uh, the fast roads initiative but nine fatalities on the roads on our fast roads in the borough in a year is too much so you know we are committed to continuing to to police those fast roads. Um, I do take your point about capacity and, and other issues, but we also make use of centralised resources from uh, the traffic officers that I referred to earlier, and also our own special constables who have trained up in Bolton to, to use the, the two laser speed guns and do their own initiatives. So they have volunteers who can come in for two, three, maybe four hours at a, at a time, uh, and maybe better placed to actually make sure we can still try to reduce the fatalities while leaving our regular officers to um to meet the incoming demand on the borough so we are we are trying to get balance to both and rick and i have had long and hard conversations over the last few months particularly um as a result of covid to be honest more about covid because when the district has been at 1.30 officers down that's a hit how do, how do we cope with that on our front line how do we juggle resources and we have come up with contingency plans as to what we might have to stop doing first in order to make sure that we could meet the demand generated by the 999 calls and the 101 calls that come in um, we're in the fortunate position where we've not had to move beyond the contingency plan um, and, and to be fair to Rick and his local team the way they've shuffled the staff around to make sure that we've kept all, all aspects of the business going and on the front foot through a really difficult time is a credit to Rick and the local team and I'm really delighted with what they've done here it's, it's, doesn't, it's not something they've done lightly but we've really done really really well to continue to deliver the kind of service we want to deliver um, with relation to the 80,000 cases dropped, it wasn't 80,000 cases dropped. HMIC came in to look at crime recording in particular, and they do their own independent assessment from GMP data. And the assessment was that over the year, 80,000 crime reports had not been properly recorded. Now, that's not to say that they've been dropped or ignored or the victim didn't get the support that they deserved. Um, I'll give you a good example of that. It might be that, for example, if there was a report of um, rape, the report of rape, perhaps domestic related, was properly recorded. And what HMIC has said is that there might be a second case behind it uh, that relates to harassment or common assault, uh, a less serious secondary offence, and it's a less serious secondary offence that hasn't been recorded. But the cumulative impact of that over the year across the whole of GM, uh, 80,000 are, are believed to have not been 
properly recorded. So, yes, some of those will relate to uh, to Bolton. Uh, I don't know exactly what the, what numbers out of the 80,000 are because obviously the force has now got access to the data from HMIC. Um, but there will there will be some. Um, what's what looks reassuring on the face of it, it they're not suggesting that we haven't supported a uh, victim in the appropriate fashion we've just failed to record perhaps the, the second or third crime that we should have recorded under the national crime recording standards and the criteria for the national crime recording standards are really specific so where the primary offense has been recorded and the victim's been supported that's great uh, you know that, that vulnerable victim will have been supported the issue is that we might have failed to record the second or third uh, less serious offence that comes behind it. So it's not cases being dropped. It, the issue was that the, the suggestion is we haven't recorded them at the front end. Now, um, locally, we don't need to do anything to respond to HMIC at the moment because, uh, unfortunately, for Greater Manchester, what wasn't reflected upon an HMIC's report is that the significant improvements we've made since July of this year with our National Crime Recording Standards compliance have not been reflected upon in the report. And quite often these reports uh, are put together some months in advance of them being released publicly and it hasn't picked up on the fact that Greater Manchester Police in terms of its centralised structure is already taking great steps to, towards um, rectifying the kind of issues that HMIC have drawn up. That doesn't mean we're taking it lightly. The headlines are awful, they don't do anything for public confidence and we want to address them as quickly as we can. But to give you a flavour of that, um, we are moving to a situation now where our call handlers can actually record crimes on the automated system. This is something that IOPS has brought that we didn't have before, so that we get first point of contact crime recording and we get a skeleton crime report report recorded as the initial call comes in and we haven't been able to do that in the past. That's already taking place. So we're getting, uh, we're, we've got more staff at the centre now, which are already at the centre, developing the centralised first point of contact crime recording um, model. Now locally, we've got what we call a crime progression team, a CPT here at Bolton. Um, that crime progression team is doing a really good job of managing the open crimes under investigation that I talked about earlier, 3,000 plus open at any one time for investigation. Um, they are kind of our, our housekeepers and the gatekeepers in relation to that. And there's a key role for them in terms of quality assuring each report of crime that's come in to make sure that we haven't missed that second and third um, perhaps less serious associated crime report. Now we've got the staff in place who are there already so we are we're working through our own systems, our own structures and our own governance to make sure that we're using the technology and the data we have appropriately to continue the push that's been taking place across GMP since since July. Um, sadly that push since July and the improvements we've already seen didn't come out in the in the very public report which um, is, is, is disappointing in terms of public confidence, but there's a lot of work going on already and we don't see the need to be diverting staff at the moment. We've already got them in place. Um, I hope that answers the question, Councillor Cunning. Well, thank you very much for that. That's actually a lot more reassuring. Uh, it, it's a pity, as you say, that some of that stuff didn't get out in the public because uh, it would have put people's minds more at rest. And, you know, um, I'm, glad to, I'm glad you were able to give us that insight. Thank you very much. Thank you, Councillor Cunningham. And we'll go over now to Councillor Heslop. So, Councillor Heslop, if you're there, please. Is Thank Councillor you, Heslop there? Yeah, we can hear you now. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, it's a couple of questions, really. Um, the first question was in two parts, but I think Councillor Hayes asked the first part of that question, uh, which was to do with police numbers. What I want um, to um, talk about is the the police officers that the Greater Manchester Mayor, Andy Burnham, promised the residents of the borough um, for accepting, I think it was an 11% increase in the mayoral precept um, and the promises was a 200, I think it was over 200 officers in Greater Manchester, 20 for Bolton, around one per ward. What I'm interested in, in respect of these additional officers is, are they accounted for separately uh, within Greater Manchester Police or have they just been swallowed up? Um, you've talked about the recruitment uh, this, this year and the aspirations and the numbers of 600 and odd, but where are these 20 officers that we were promised? And the second question relates to communications with um, the um, local police officers. 
Uh, I was told that the police, the local office of the say Kersley Ward, former former police officers, were reluctant to give the contact details to to the councillors for that area. Uh, I'm not so sure whether it's unique to the Kersley Ward. Maybe it is. Um, maybe it's not. The councillors probably know the answer to that. But I was just wondering, um, is that the case? Um, the the numbers being provided um, of the um, local officer. Um, to the councillors of that particular ward. OK, thank you very much. Yeah, thank you, Councillor Heslop. We've got police numbers and perhaps being ricking with the local contact details. I think we have had some blockages with it with local communications, but some of that is related to when an officer is on duty or off duty and the expectation of the person trying to get in touch directly. So it's, it's not been a, a ter terribly straightforward position, but I'm sure Rick will want to come in that for, as a local uh, superintendent. On the subject of the extra 200 GM wide officers that came in, and, and you're right, what one per ward equated to 20 odd for um, Bolton, uh, they haven't just been swallowed up. We have seen a growth here in Bolton. Uh, I think so far we're on 12 extra officers on the front line as student officers, in addition to those that we'd have received anyway, and the rest will come in. As I, as I said earlier, it's a, it's a two year programme, so they've not been swallowed up, but they are, they are here and they are coming through as student officers. Uh, and as one of you, your fellow councillors alluded to earlier, it, it takes a little time for us to uh, recruit and train, then mentor and then get to a position where they can can operate independently. So there is a little bit of a time lag and it's, it, it's sadly, I wish we could flick a switch and just have them all singing, all dancing, ready to go. But um, it, it takes about 18 months to get a student officer from brand spanking new recruit to a position where they are uh, independent patrolling and, and um, contributing in the way that we'd all like them to. So there is a slight delay, but I can assure you that we are seeing them here in uh, Bolton. Um, and actually notably, we've seen the growth in Bolton and in Wigan before we've seen it elsewhere in GM, which is uh, you know, a recognition, as I alluded to earlier, that the chief officers are recognising the demands um, placed on the officers here in this part of Greater Manchester. Uh, I hope that covers that point. I'll go over to Rick now for the, the local officer communications. Rick? Yeah, thank you. Um, I think I probably need to know a little bit more about the issue to, to give some more comment around it. So forgive me if I speak in more general terms uh, and I'll gladly take it up um, again uh, after the scrutiny committee to get the precise details. But we have had to be cautious historically with regards to not encouraging people to uh, report crime um, via the wrong channels. So it's really important that we get the report in through 101, 999, the online systems as opposed to people mistaking WhatsApp groups or a neighbourhood officer's um, email address or mobile number as the appropriate uh, reporting mechanism because of course the danger could be they're not on duty and that issue sits there in the ether until such time as it's picked up so that that is a concern and a balance that we have to get right but in terms of the um, principle of certainly councillors and members of the public having direct contact with neighbourhood officers, absolutely, it's something that we, we encourage, it's something that I push regularly, uh, I do want those uh, connections making. What's probably negatively impacted that of late, however, is the fact that I have had to withdraw some of my neighbourhood officers on a, on a regular basis uh, to fill in gaps where I've had isolation through COVID or responding to some of the additional demands. Um, and unfortunately, the nature of the policing being as it is, one of the first areas to suffer the impact uh, when I've got a drawdown on resources tend to be neighbourhood officers. I don't know if that's got anything to do with the issue or whether or not there's something that I need to address there. But as I said, I'd be very happy to speak to you afterwards. And uh, if you give me the precise details, then I'll make sure it's addressed. Uh, would you like to uh, come back, uh, Councillor Heslop? Yes, thank you, Chair. Yeah, I, I could understand there would have to be um, parameters and rules for um, speaking to officers and, and we accept obviously that officers are not on duty all the time. It's just a reassurance really, it's not to report crime. Um, I think most councillors wouldn't um, dream of doing something like that, but sometimes it's a good, um, good to give feedback to officers um, that are covering those communities from residents and, it, and it's the ability to do that, not necessarily 
to uh, to look at crime. Yes, there'd have to be rules. Uh, yes, there would have to be parameters um, for engagement. Um, and but I, I really do think it would be helpful if the councillors did have some sort of direct line of communication with the the officers covering that particular uh, area. Thank you very much. And thank, oh, sorry, thank you very much for the clarity, clarity on the first point. That was reassuring that, that 12 officers of these 20s are already in place. We had no idea about that. Thank you. Could I just quickly come back on the, course, the, the local concept, please? Uh, yeah, uh, just to reassure you, I agree wholeheartedly with what it is um, you want, and it's something that I, I do encourage. So if there's a problem in respect of people, uh, especially councillors, being able to get the local law officers, then that is something I will address. But um, um, the, uh, just going back to uh, I, uh, the point you've made that you know full well that you know there's appropriate reporting mechanisms. Unfortunately, that isn't the case with everyone, and that's why I've had to emphasise the point. Um, but um, thank you for acknowledging that, and you're absolutely right. You do need that local link. Thank you, and we're going to go over to Halliwell now and to Councillor Akhtar Zaman. Councillor Zaman. Thank you, Chair. Um, and before I make this comment, I, I want to acknowledge um, that the police are working under immense um, financial and uh, operational pressure. I'm, I'm very well aware of that. Now, um, the comment I'm going to make, it, it, I think it mainly deals with perception. Um, so for over the last um, few months, I've been approached by a number of constituents in my ward um, who have been complaining about drug dealing in their neighbourhoods. Now, I'm aware that that information um, in, in some cases has been shared uh, with the local uh, neighbourhood officers. Um, and the perception out there is that nothing gets done. Now, um, in, 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 in one particular case, somebody said to me, uh, one of my constituents, uh, well, the police are not interested in, in dealing with these uh, people who are operating at local level. They want to go after the big fish, uh, people who are their suppliers and cut off that supply chain, which is understandable. Uh, but nevertheless, um, when there are people in your local neighborhood, who are the main sort of distributors of, of drugs, which uh, brings with it other problems. Um, and, and speeding cars is also connected to some of these individuals uh, in our in our neighborhoods. Um, is there anything going on around that to curb that problem and to address this perception, um, which in many cases is, is the wrong perception? Uh, that the police doesn't want to deal with these local uh, problems. Thank you. Yeah, I'll, uh, I'll come on that, in on that if I may. Um, I, I completely share your concerns and I'm well aware of the fact that um, many residents don't necessarily see the activity that I alluded to at the beginning of the presentation in relation to uh, some of the more serious and organised crime groups that are in fact recruiting and driving the street level dealers effectively. Um, so whilst we do go to some lengths around our media campaigns, social media um, strategies to try and get messages out there, the, the reality is we don't hit anywhere near the uh, number of people that we would like to uh, and we're, we're always left unfortunately with the perception that we're not necessarily addressing some of the issues and of course there are some issues which we just can't resource and going back to uh, my earlier acknowledgement that I do have to unfortunately draw down on some of my neighbourhood resources uh, at times. It does impact my ability to uh, deal with some of the street level uh, issues. Um, so we certainly do address street level issues, so I'm not telling you this and suggesting that they don't get addressed. Uh, the reality is though uh, we will not be hitting every single one of them unfortunately. Uh, as we would wish to because we have to go back to a prioritisation of our resources to the highest harm within communities. So there's a balancing act and uh, it's an incredible difficult one to achieve um, and reassure the public that we are addressing uh, all their concerns. So 
I think going back to Councillor Heslop's point with regards to having that local contact with your neighbourhood officers and being able to discuss issues to make sure that we're getting this balance right, I think that is critical. So I think what I'm going to do is make sure that uh, my Chief Inspector Partnerships, Nick Williams, uh, put something out to all councillors uh, this week just to make absolutely crystal clear what the contacts are at neighbourhood level in order that some of these concerns can be discussed more thoroughly. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Zaman. Thank you uh, as well, uh, Rick, for that. And we're going to go over to the leader of uh, Bolton Council, Councillor David Greenhouse now. Councillor Greenhouse. Thanks, Chair. Um, I, I just want to begin by putting uh, my thanks on record to the, to the police. Um, Stuart and, and to Rick especially, who um, I just want to pay tribute to the partnership working that we have. Um, all, all parties, I think, uh, cross parties appreciate the partnership working, that we, we have them here tonight at Scrutiny and that they are accessible to us and that we can you know, work together where possible. Uh, I want to thank them also during the crisis because um, you know, the pressures, I think it's been alluded to by, by members of all parties, um, the pressures that the police have been under, the work they've had to do, the challenging circumstances they've had to act in, you know, the responses they've done, particularly in Bolton during various uh, demonstrations, uh, the challenges uh, and the, the additional response that we've had uh, during uh, periods when we've just immediately come out of lockdown and we faced real challenges in, in certain areas, in, in certain um, hospitality sector, you know, the response has always been there and they've always been ready to respond and come to help us. So so I, I, I begin with with that thanks, really, uh, that they uh, that, you know, the police are a very valued partner to us as a council um, and I hope we are to them. Uh, and but I, I also want, as it's been alluded to um, earlier by my colleague, Councillor Muslim, um, we did have um, Stuart and, and Rick very kindly attended an informal cabinet a couple of weeks ago because of concerns, not just concerns that we had as a cabinet, but concerns that had been um, expressed to us by colleagues from other parties on, on a number of issues. Um, I would like us, you know, to have more of these kind of cross party discussions, not just necessarily at scrutiny, but maybe some more informally uh, moving forward. Um, because I think you know we did cover many of the issues that were were covered to, uh, tonight. In fact, I'm I'm not sure that cabinet actually didn't maybe gave uh, Stuart and Rick a bit of a rougher time, uh, but um, but certainly the speeding. Um, certainly, just now I'm really pleased that Councillor Zaman has raised the amount of drug dealing uh, on our streets, um, and um, the levels of um, communication in a way and the perception. Um, there is an uh, there is, I think, historically a great amount of goodwill for the police, and and I fear and I worry this was put to um, Stuart and, and Rick that too often now um, when when I tell people you must report it to police, I get back what's the point, and that is not what I, I want to hear. It's not what I think the police deserve, um, and I think that comes out of communication of what the police are doing and what they're achieving and what benefits they're bringing. And I know a lot of this might be confidential, it might be subdued to say at the time, but I think the police can't do enough of the success stories that they have in terms of, you know, uh, uh, bringing down some of the major gangs. I think there is a lot in what Councillor Zaman has said. Um, if I can speak uh, parochially, uh, my ward, we have many cases, particularly during COVID, uh, of, of on-street drug dealing and um, we have little response uh, and I think uh, re residents find it very very difficult to understand exactly what Councillor Zaman said you know we're going for the big boys we need to we need to overcome that and that is the same with speeding that is the same during Covid the response to to burglaries to other incidents accepting completely the pressures that the police are under but we must be very careful to all work together and we all owe it to ourselves as well as councillors to once that is shared on social media i mean i hope we all follow i, I follow gmp north of course because that's my area and share it regularly on, on my facebook pages i think we should be promoting the extra patrols that police do antisocial behavior is another issue i know that the client 
many of us, like many of us in our wards, uh, and we're all constantly, I know, asking for our local police if we can get more patrols, please, more patrols. Um, uh, but when there are more patrols, we need to tell people that there are more patrols so that the police get the credit for that and acknowledgement. I'm delighted to have seen the, the extra speed uh, speeding uh, initiatives that have been taking place over the last couple of weeks. Absolutely delighted. And certainly at leaders meetings at GM, uh, Bev Hughes has given a commitment that Speedwatch is moving forward. It's going to be a priority and it will move forward. But I, 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 I don't know what blockages have happened, but certainly they have not happened as quickly as we would have hoped this, this initiative. Uh, when we've known it was there, we, we've all been grown quite impatient of why it's not moved at speed. But I'm going to finish again where I started, thanking the police for all they do. I think there is work where we can all work together to achieve better outcomes, communicate a lot better with one another, keep up the dialogue uh, and, and thank you um, for being as responsive as you are to us as a council all the time. I know Bolton is one of the highest demand areas uh, that has to be of concern to us as well. And it would be good at some time, I think, to, to get you back and really analyse some of these areas of uh, hotspots and crimes that are taking place, because some of them are of real concern, I think, when you look at some of the statistics. Uh, but thank you very much, Chair, for, for letting me speak and, um, and I'll hand back to you. Thank you, Councillor green -Alsh. And uh, as the leader of the council, I think you've uh, summed uh, up very well indeed. And as the chair of this committee, could I thank our senior police officers this evening, Stuart Ellison and Rick Jackson for attending and covering all of those issues which have been uh, debated and for answering all of the, uh, all of the questions uh, from the members of the committee. Uh, so I wish you well over Christmas and the new year. Uh, gentlemen. Chair, sorry to interrupt, sorry, but Councillor Wright has indicated that he wishes uh, to speak. Well, I think what we'll do is take Councillor Wright's uh, question during the Community Safety Partnership. OK, so um, thank you again, uh, officers, and we'll move on to item eight, which is our Community Safety Update. And we're going to go over to Rafael Martinez, uh, to give us this community safety update. Raphael. Good evening, Chair. Good evening, committee members. Can I just first of all chat that you can hear me OK? We can indeed, we can hear you. Thank you, Chair. Uh, and John, can I just check, am I sharing my slides? Uh, it's up to you, Ralph. I can do it from my end. OK, OK, that'd be great. Thank you very much. No worries, pal. Um, so, yeah, good evening, uh, Rafael Martinez. I'm the head of community safety at Bolton Council. Um, and I think this um, this uh, update in relation to the community safety partnership uh, will follow on nicely from um, the police's update from both um, Stuart and Rick and, and perhaps gives more of a partnership flavour in terms of how the police interact with uh, some of the other statutory partners uh, that form the community safety partnership. Um, so this is the annual um, scrutiny update um, on behalf of the um, community safety partnership, which I'll, I'll run through. Uh, I believe Stuart will still be on the call uh, as well if there are uh, any questions towards the end as well. Um, next slide, please, John. OK, so many um, committee members will be familiar with the Community Safety Partnership, but I just wanted to, um, I, I guess, just, uh, uh, I guess, re-emphasise the, um, the kind of the, the, the broader kind of uh, setup really for the Community Safety Partnership. So it is um, a partnership that's in, um, it's got statutory responsibilities. Um, it is made up by uh, a number of different responsible authorities. So um, that includes the police, the local authority, uh, the fire service. We also have the clinical commissioning group and we also have the probation service. So collectively, those partners um, have the responsibility to come together to design um, relevant strategies, relevant plans um, to respond to um, um, uh, risks associated to crime and disorder. And we see very much the Community Safety Partnership aligning to um, aspirations around the Vision 2030 and in particular um, supporting the delivery of the strong and distinctive theme, um, being really mindful that as a collective 
partner agencies, we have um, quite a lot to offer when it comes to delivering a safer Bolton. Um, we're currently in, we're coming towards the end of our um, cycle in terms of priorities and partnership plan. Um, each cycle lasts for about uh, about three years that uh, are, are kind of refreshed on an annual basis. Um, but we are coming to the end of this current three year cycle. Um, so the updates I'm going to provide just relate back to the kind of the last year and um, some of the partnership highlights in terms of um, the work that's been undertaken across some of these priority areas. Um, so um, a reminder in terms of the priorities, so very similar to um, what Rick and Stuart have, have already given from a kind of single agency police perspective. Uh, it's not surprising that from a broader community safety partnership perspective, the priorities that we undertook back in 2018. So um, no particular order, uh, reducing crime and antisocial behaviour, protecting vulnerable people, supporting victims and to reduce repeat victimisation, prevent offending, reduce reoffending and manage risk. And then the last one, although it's just under my uh, dialogue box, uh, I think is, is relates to improving responses to hate crime and, and generally community cohesion. Next slide, please. So now just to give some of the kind of key updates relating to some of those um, um, kind of key priority areas. So first of all, I just wanted to flag um, a, a particular project that we've had commissioned in Bolton now for a number of years. We know as a, as a partnership, antisocial behaviour does remain an important area for members of the public and, and if left unchecked can, can obviously be, be quite devastating. So um, this has been an important area to support the most vulnerable victims in terms of high risk and vulnerability relating to uh, antisocial behaviour. So we have a commission project um, currently delivered by Onward Homes, uh, which are a partner um, linked to uh, Bolton Community Homes, a registered uh, social landlord, and they actually provide some uh, intense advocacy for uh, our most vulnerable victims. Since May uh, of this year alone, um, the project was able to support 36 cases um, and in doing so um, actually brings together a number of different partners to support that individual on any, on any particular case. Um, we've adopted, um, similar to the approach we've undertaken to how we address domestic abuse, we've adopted a similar approach to how we address vulnerability relating to antisocial behaviour. So we have antisocial behaviour risk assessment conferences and this brings together um, police, the local authority, community safety function. It'll bring together any particular uh, housing providers that have got um, a stake in, in, in the particular case, as well as the advocate supporting the vulnerable victim. Um, the advocate um, provides the, the, the victim's voice and then collectively agencies put in place a supportive plan um, to bring a resolution to, um, to, to the issues that that um, uh, individual has, has been suffering. In, in the main, um, referrals into this project comes from um, neighbourhood policing teams, um, from some of the uh, council services, uh, community safety clearly being one of them, but also um, other colleagues in, in regulatory services, so pollution control and um, trading standards. Uh, and then we get them also from other um, social landlords. Um, uh, we've got a, a, a relatively high acceptance rate uh, of 88%. Um, some of the some of the areas that perhaps um, we, where we, we might not necessarily take on a particular case for this project just relates to the vulnerability. So there's an assessment done um, at, at the first contact with the project just to try and establish that the project is working with the most vulnerable. We accept that there are there are lots of uh, victims uh, in terms of suffer antisocial behaviour, um, but we do try and prioritise this project solely for the most vulnerable. Um, there'll be no surprises that COVID. Um, has had an impact. Um, clearly a lot of the face-to-face -face work that would have been undertaken by this project is now done uh, remotely um, via phone calls um, and, and engagement um, online, um, but we're still tracking um, um, through the monitoring of the project. We are still seeing kind of high levels of satisfaction um, with this project, which gives us some reassurance. Um, but, but hopefully we would like to get back to kind of face-to-face -face interaction. Um, but, but certainly since COVID, 
um, we do know that um, um, uh, victims are still being able to communicate both with the advocate and still share any ongoing uh, issues or concerns they may have. Next slide, please. Um, I also now wanted to move on, still still relating to antisocial behaviour, but also now referencing um, something that we have to do as a statutory function. Um, and this relates to uh, what we call case reviews uh, or, or colloquially known as uh, the community trigger. Um, so as part of the legislation, um, community safety partnerships uh, up and down the country um, are um, responsible now for um, uh, overseeing a process that allows a member of the public to ask for a case review um, if they believe um, their particular situations meet a particular threshold. Um, Bolton's process um, um, for how a case review is undertaken is contained on the Bolton Council website and is contained on the housing provider websites um, that operate in, in Bolton. Um, and for those applications that meet the criteria, um, we, we then um, move into a panel arrangement um, as, as officers working across the partnership to identify how we can put in place recommendations and interventions to support um, that, that particular applicant. Um, for those applications that come through, um, for the vast majority, we know there's always a recommendation we can uh, in terms of uh, offer, in terms of offering further action and, and offering some suggestions of improvement. On the right hand side, um, I just wanted to share um, the the kind of the the numbers and the volumes that are coming through for case reviews, and you can kind of see the 19 um, January up until the end of November of 19, compared with the same period in 2020, uh, and you can see the number of applications received um, by the council. And I say the council because we coordinate the gateway to the case review uh, coming in uh, and, and are obviously escal are increasing. Um, the criteria numbers you can see kind of kind of drop out and I just wanted to share some some um, rationale really as to why um, some of those cases are dropping out and, and, and fundamentally it's just because the applicant hasn't met the necessary criteria. So um, there are there are set criteria as part of the process. Um, and um, so three reports to a particular agency within a six month period is, is, is the criteria. Um, often that, that doesn't happen when an applicant um, uh, makes the report, um, but we will still try and offer alternative uh, options and make alternative signposting and suggestions, even though they might not necessarily make the formal uh, case review process. Um, and then um, this year we've had we've held eight, eight reviews in total. Um, we undertook um, earlier this year, um, very early on pre-COVID, um, an assessment of the um, national charity ASB Help. Uh, they undertook a review of the community trigger across the country and identified a number of areas for development. Um, so we undertook a cross-reference um, kind of checks and balances to determine whether our own uh, processes were, were, in, were, were in line with that, with that charity's recommendations. Um, and it was reassuring that when we reported back to the Community Safety Partnership, um, that actually Bolton's uh, processes do meet, um, are, are fully compliant uh, of the legislation and do meet, um, for the most part, the, the, um, the national recommendations made by the charity. There are a couple of areas that we've identified that we wanted to kind of strengthen. Um, so uh, um, one area that we want to take forward is, is just going into a deep dive on a couple of cases uh, on an annual basis to give us that uh, understanding and reassurance um, in, t in terms of those perhaps that didn't meet the, 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 um, the trigger uh, application phase, but also those that did and whether there's anything more we can do. Uh, and also the other recommendation was that we include this now as a, a formal part of uh, the scrutiny each time we come back on the community safety partnership update. Next slide please John. Okay so again still um, sticking with antisocial behaviour, um, I also wanted to update scrutiny in terms of um, the coordinated approach we undertake as a partnership um, to flag um, and um, to, to provide support to young people in terms of uh, antisocial behaviour. 
Um, so um, my service coordinate um, the kind of the entry point and the pathway um, for young people who uh, persistently continue to uh, get involved in, in antisocial behaviour. And I must stress this is this is antisocial behaviour pre uh, any involvement in, a, in the criminal justice space. Um, the main aim um, of us doing this is really to um, to kind of intervene as early as we possibly can and try to prevent that escalation into the criminal justice system. Um, the process um, uh, has a twin track approach of both support uh, at the right intervention point um, from um, the prevention uh, arm of the youth offending team, but also does offer some challenge in the form of kind of the uh, informal um, contracts such as anti acceptable behaviour contracts. And on the right hand side, I've just provided some uh, volume figures so the um, uh, committee can get a sense of the, the volumes that we, we currently deal with. Uh, and, and clearly you, you, you can see that um, there's, 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 there's clearly a difference between 2019 uh, and 2020 in terms of the numbers. Uh, for the most part, we know first warnings, albeit our advisory, uh, where a young person and their parents will get an advisory letter to, um, that kind of explains um, the rationale as to why a young person has been referred to the pathway. Um, that very much often just just prevents any further escalation. Um, parents obviously then 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 uh, get involved and and, and become more in, 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 in involved in in tackling the antisocial behaviour of their, their children. And clearly, we 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 then consider it at the next warning level um, um, referrals into you know, targeted youth support. We have seen volumes change this year, and, and COVID has had an impact on that. Um, um, clearly, lockdowns um, and, um, and and just generally, we know um, from the updates previously from the police that the that, that crime um, across certain um, crime types has has dropped, and we've certainly seen that presenting in terms of the picture, in terms of the referrals into the process. Um, but we also know that that potentially, in terms of some of that, um, that has led to kind of some of the compliance relating to COVID, and actually some of the kind of the social distancing aspects, not necessarily antisocial behaviour per se. One of the key areas for for um, kind of um, transformation that we want to really strengthen around this project is the emerging early help model, um, which um, is being led by colleagues in, in children's services, which will um, um, strengthen early interventions uh, for young people. And so we're currently now in discussions with with um, the early help strategic leads about how we can ensure antisocial behaviour individuals who, who are known to us and come to our attention can get an even earlier intervention than we than, than, than possibly they were already getting. Uh, next slide, please. So moving on to um, protecting vulnerable um, people and some of that kind of bro bro broader vulnerability that, that um, Stuart and Rick related to in terms of domestic abuse. Um, domestic abuse is um, a significant area of work for us in Bolton and indeed as a partnership, um, as, as, a, as a council, we're, we're heavily involved in, in, in approaches to respond to domestic abuse and trying to, to strengthen um, the coordinated response. Um, We've undertaken a significant amount of work, particularly um, during the first lockdown that's continued right through the summer and into the autumn. Um, very early on, um, concerned with um, 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 domestic abuse and, and unfortunately people not being as safe as they should be in their own homes. So um, quite quickly we adapted. Um, we looked at some emergency measures relating to how we um, manage and support high risk victims through the MARAC process. Um, so that ordinarily would would have been a monthly arrangement, albeit support is done on a day on a daily basis. We brought that um, um, uh, much uh, much more frequently to fortnightly, with um, with daily check ins to make sure we were seeing the prevalence um, overnight. We've linked strongly across into children safeguarding partnerships. There's a there's a there's obviously um, a big crossover into into safeguarding, uh, and again through those fortnight, fortnightly governance arrangements, making sure that any barriers or concerns come in from, uh, or indeed police or social care or indeed specialist domestic abuse providers that we we, we were responding to those and supporting as as much as we possibly could. Um, community safety continued to have daily contact right through um, uh, the whole uh, lockdown in terms of both uh, lockdowns and through the summer related to specialist providers. 
uh, making sure that staffing levels remained high, that we were we were alive to any potential changes or issues that COVID may have had just in the workforce more generally. And we also were able to support um, providers in terms of accessing uh, emergency funding that came via the combined authority via the Ministry of Justice uh, and making sure that the business case um, for those services was 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 articulated correctly. Um, we've also um, um, undertaken domestic homicide reviews, and this is a statutory function for the Community Safety Partnership. Um, uh, unfortunately, where there is uh, has been a, a, a homicide and there is some suggestion or indication that um, in that individual's life there, there has been some form of domestic abuse, then uh, we are mandated to undertake a review um, to identify the lessons learned uh, in, in terms of that kind of workforce and cross partnership basis. Um, so for the last um, kind of year, we, we, we've been working on three reviews. Um, they're at various stages um, and the primary primary function is, as, as, as I said, to, to kind of um, to identify learning. Um, COVID has had an impact, uh, a significant impact because these reviews uh, aim to really bring um, uh, family engagement um, to, to support professionals in terms of understanding possibly what, what more could we do or could have done in a particular case. Um, and the family engagement um, did did stall um, in in the early parts of COVID, um, but I'm, I, I can I can now report that certainly the um, independent authors that we commissioned to to undertake these reviews uh, are now beginning to re re engage with that family engagement and make sure we've got um, family members part of part of the process. Next slide, please. So a, a domestic abuse uh, related project that I just wanted to provide some update um, is, um, is, is the IRIS um, adv Advocacy and Education Project. Um, it's a primary care pathway that we, est that we established in Bolton um, about six years ago now, but it's um, a really standout project for us, that was something that we're really, um, we're really proud of. Um, so we undertook um, um, some evidence from Bristol that um, designing pathways directly from um, general practice, so from GPs, giving them the opportunity to directly refer domestic abuse victims into a specific pathway where they get specific level of support actually has a high efficacy rate. Um, and, and, and basically this project has grown in Bolton year on year and, 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 and GPs have, have really come to recognise it as a brand um, and, and, and it started to kind of really shape how primary care contribute to the coordinated response. Um, so um, for, the, for the period 1st of December 19 till the 7th of October, there was 227 new referrals to that project, uh, which is um, a little bit down on the previous year. Um, we do know that again, um, lockdown has had an impact there. GPs um, were um, and still continue not necessarily to have that face-to-face -face engagement with, with, um, uh, with patients. Uh, and we believe that that ha has had some impact, but we know where there's been previous individuals who have engaged with the project, they've come directly to the project where they've still encountered ongoing issues, which I think shows some reassurance uh, for us in terms of the project and what it's been able to do to support victims. Um, so the project, similarly to others that I've already referenced, has moved to a virtual and telephone based contact. Um, and um, certainly for victims that has that has proved been has proved to been um, OK in some in some instances, that's actually been really welcomed um, because it gives them an opportunity to do some of that interaction, um, uh, at, 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 I guess, at times that are suitable to them. And certainly from a GP perspective, we, we're actually seeing some, some, some enhancements because the, the, the training that's offered to GPs now is done via an online platform that actually clinicians now are able to network and share ex experiences more broadly because they're interacting on this platform and around this project um, in, in, in a different way than they would have done previously. And I just thought it'd be helpful to share a recent quote from the training module that was provided recently by a, a social prescriber, which I, which I know has been circulated um, with, the, with, with, these, with these slides. Next slide, please. 
So another area of um, statutory function for the partnership relates to um, uh, radicalisation and how we collectively try to respond to um, vulnerability and, and particularly focusing on those who are most vulnerable um, to radicalisation um, uh, in terms of extremism. So in Bolton, we continue to operate a, a multi-agency panel, which is known as Channel. Um, again, this is a statutory function um and um, like other arrangements we we moved we've moved to a virtual arrange a virtual setup uh, and we still continue to meet on a monthly basis um to talk uh, and provide support interventions for those who are most vulnerable uh, as identified across the partnership to radicalization we have seen a reduction in case loads um certainly in the early part of lockdown um but these have started now to revert back to, to normal levels and um, it, 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 mental health is, is definitely a significant factor that is a feature in, in pretty much most of uh, our cases uh, and mental health professionals on the channel panel do play an important role in terms of identifying opportunities to intervene with, with, um, with these individuals. Um, the individuals who are uh, open to channel are both adults and young people um, and um, there has been some recent statutory guidance which we are currently um, working through in terms of making sure we're fully compliant from a Bolton perspective. There was a new national referral form um, that was um, launched in July. So this is um, across the country, one referral form for how agencies can um, refer an individual they've got concerns with into the prevent space. Um, uh, in Bolton, we've contributed to uh, a review of channel and we'll, we're waiting for the findings of that, which will come out in February time. And again, we'll, we'll unpick that to determine any recommendations and lessons learned. Um, we're, we're also in the process of refreshing the action plan for the Prevent Steering Group, which is based on Bolton's uh, counter-terrorism local profile and making sure that that is responding to, um, um, to the threats that's been uh, identified through, through that particular profile. And we're now currently benefiting from a resource across um, Salford and Berry and Bolton uh, in terms of a cluster, um, supporting us to um, enhance our offer um, with organisations around Prevent, and particularly through um, schools and education settings. Next slide, please. Touching on serious uh, violence, and I know that's um, been a feature in the in the previous um, uh, policing update, and in particular youth violence. Um, so we updated at the previous scrutiny um, funding that um, the Community Safety Partnership had received relating to serious violence. Uh, and this programme uh, is just some of the uh, areas uh, in terms of highlights that I just wanted to um, just um, um, share with, with committee colleagues. Uh, and to give a sense of the breadth and some of this is clearly aimed at trying to intervene earlier, trying to prevent earlier so that some of the uh, issues that, that Rick and Stuart talked about in terms of the kind of the enforcement end of, of kind of in particular policing and the criminal justice system, hopefully we can try and prevent that, that escalation and, and move to kind of crisis point. The first is the Early Intervention Youth Fund or the STEER project. And over the last 12 months, um, um, 31 young people have benefited from direct support. Um, um, so some of this has been very much mentoring and some kind of that very kind of assertive uh, mentoring and support to, to some quite challenging young people. Um, this particular project is going to go, is, is, un, is undergoing independent evaluation uh, by Edge Hill, uh, which has been commissioned by uh, the Violence Reduction Unit at Greater Manchester. So we are awaiting um, the outcomes of that evaluation, but we do know for the 31 young people, there has been some really strong positive change in terms of the, the one, their escalation and reducing risk in terms of that escalation, in terms of their um, uh, involvement in um, serious crime, in particular knife crime. Through some of the investment, we've also seen um, clinical psychologists working to support our youth offending team and allowing them the opportunity to think about how they engage with a young person from a trauma informed perspective. Um, as you can imagine, some of these young people can be quite challenging. And so for professionals looking at how alternative mechanisms to um, um, to engage uh, is really important and, 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 and understanding the, the kind of the trauma that young person may have had uh, in their life is an important tool to be able to potentially re-engage and sustain them in some um, lasting intervention and programmes. 
Uh, public Health have currently commissioned uh, a particular prevent study relating to adverse childhood experiences. So for the first time in Bolton, we'll have a, a real understanding of the levels of childhood uh, adverse childhood experiences in Bolton and what that means um, for potentially programmes going forward around serious violence and opportunities to intervene. Um, there were comments earlier relating to Opspector and, and, and Operation Barter and, and other knife crime related issues that we've seen, particularly in the town centre. And, and to try and to support our youth offending colleagues, we've seen um, investment through the vi serious violence funding um, to actually increase capacity to be able to do some of that preventative work, particularly um, through schools. We've then got um, uh, a project which Bolton uh, is one of six pilot sites, which is being community, which is a community led violence project, which is looking to strengthen and invest in, the, in our local voluntary and community sector. Um, <clears throat> so the particular area that's been identified uh, in Falmouth in the Newberry area um, that has come up in terms of Greater Manchester's kind of demand generator, which we've identified as a real localised site. Um, but, but with learning across the other areas of Greater Manchester to determine how a community led violence approach can sustain uh, more community based uh, interventions uh, without necessarily the need for kind of statutory agencies exclusively. And we're also supporting um, some ongoing mentoring and leadership aspiration programmes with, with 20 uh, young people in, in the north part of the borough. Next slide, please. So just um, some um, how some of our links back to Greater Manchester Police and Crime Plan uh, standing together. So there's been different awards that we get in the Community Safety Partnership. Um, hate crime, uh, we get a particular award, um, um, £7,893, which we've been able to award to uh, um, seven community groups in, in, in Bolton, um, looking at a whole host of different uh, facets relating to, to hate crime in terms of awareness, and kind of intergen intergenerationality. We also get uh, the benefit of um, specific funding for VCSE groups through Standing Together. Uh, and again, over the last year, there's been 100, over 127,000 that's been awarded to, to 17 groups uh, all, all across a whole host of different priorities. And, and, and that's very much aimed at um, supporting our local community safety partnership plan and the Greater Manchester Standing Together plan of which Bolton contributed when they uh, undertook their annual report um, earlier this earlier this year. Next slide, please. And then this is the last slide, conscious of, of time, Chair, uh, but just some opportunities and developments. So uh, we recognise that within the community safety partnership, there's there's definitely been um, a kind of a move to consider vulnerability and and how we improve our respect respective re uh, responses to vulnerable individuals across the system and, and, and clearly um, there are other strategic partnerships that operate um, which we've got good relationships with but I think there's definitely more we can do in terms of improving that collaboration which so you know we're keen to understand how we can uh, achieve that so uh, an area in particular in terms of learning reviews from domestic homicide reviews how we can embed that um, in, 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 in terms of the workforce more generally and, and just kind of just strengthening some of our uh, partnership alignments, I think is really important. Uh, I've touched on the investment in the VCSE sector and, and, and um, as part of that, we want to look at integrating that, that, that funding into Bolton's fund um, and, and obviously uh, further using opportunities to ensure Bolton's fund um, 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 in, in terms of the aspirations for that fund and strengthening the VCSE with, with this kind of safer, um, uh, safer messaging. We, we've also undertaken uh, a partnership health check um, as a as a collective group of, of, of individuals and, and, and what that means for us as a partnership. And I think generally that's been a positive um, experience and there are some areas for us to um, to think about going forward. Um, but, but largely we are kind of complying with statutory duties. Um, I think there's probably some elements around just how we operate uh, as a collective and, and some of the delivery structures that we want to strengthen. Um, with next year, we've got a significant piece of work to review the next three year partnership plan and set those priorities going forward uh, for the community safety partnership, having consideration to that health check on what we want to do as partners and how we want to work as a partnership uh, in terms of improvements going forward. Um, and then just lastly, just in terms of some analytical capacity 
to support the, the partnership plan refresh and some of the requirements of the domestic abuse bill, which will mean uh, a needs assessment uh, will need to be produced next year, um, preparing um, Bolton for the duties under that bill. And again, we're trying to just identify the analytical capacity to be able to undertake and support the partnership in, 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 in those areas. But there are also others um, going forward, in particular serious violence. Next slide, please. And then, yeah, um, happy to to take any questions, Chair. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Raphael. And uh, we're going to go over to Horridge first of all to Councillor Peter Wright. Peter Wright, please. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Uh, this is just a quick uh, question. It's, it's not been raised yet, uh, and perhaps perhaps uh, the partnerships can help with this police and trading standards and the like. Uh, is a case of antisocial behaviour from uh, youths. It's a, I know Horwich, and I'm sure many of other boroughs in Bolton is plagued with these uh, little gas canisters, happy gas. And uh, it's not just a few of these hanging around, you get like 50, 60, 70 of them at, a, uh, at any one time, you find them. And uh, these are vulnerable children that are taking this uh, gas who may not realise, fully realise how dangerous they are. I just wondered, uh, is there anything that, uh, well, the, well, the partnerships, uh, trading standards are like, could take a tougher stance on the shops, uh, maybe the police, uh, is there any localised, uh, well, any anything localised the police can do to, uh, prevents the sale of this going into the shops. And uh, I just wonder if there's something a uh, pathway could use uh, to uh, to intervene with this, because I'm sure if there's a, we tackle this problem, I'm sure it's uh, it will solve a lot of other uh, problems with the youths, because they're not uh, off the head. I you know, just wondered, uh, wonder if uh, anybody could uh, give advice on this place. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. Uh, and that um, issue is on the committee work programme, so um, we'll go back over to Raphael. <clears throat> yeah, so um, in terms of the gas canisters, um, we do rely on obviously that intelligence coming from uh, particularly reporting um, particularly premises that may be um, selling um, the canisters. So um, colleagues in trading standards and our regulatory uh, functions within the council um, do take proactive steps um, to undertake um, uh, visits to those premises. Uh, and I do know um, through the head of regulatory services, um, they are pursuing uh, enforcement action uh, relating to where we where there is evidence uh, where um, the premises have sold uh, these gas canisters, uh, in particular to, to young people. Uh, and there's very clear evidence that um, they're not, they're not um, uh, there's no intention that they would be used um, for the purposes of which they're being sold. Um, so, our reg so certainly regulatory services are um, based on the intelligence um, that comes in across the various different uh, partnerships, um, certainly do um, look at the kind of compliance issue uh, and try to look at the sales um, and enforcement relating to where uh, gas canisters are, are being sold um, um, to young people. Um, from a young person's perspective, the um, Substance Misuse Service certainly does a lot of work um, to um, uh, work with young people and with some of the messaging around um, um, drugs and, and the impact that they have on young people. Uh, and certainly I know this is uh, an area that's on their uh, attention in terms of uh, a, a new drug that still is harmful to young people and there is some of that kind of public health messaging uh, required and, and, and the Young Person Substance Misuse Service I do know um, do work to, to support young people in, uh, in, in that particular case. Thank you for that Raphael and we'll go over to uh, Councillor Paul Heslop uh, now please. Thank you, Chair. Um, I'm going to go back to uh, and use the um, the common term for this, the community trigger. 
what I'm intrigued by is when somebody finds it, uh, they're at the end of the end of their tether um, and they have to initiate or invoke the community trigger. They fill in the application, they go online or whatever the, 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 the mechanism is to report this uh, and they're asked a series of questions about how they have um, reported it, um, the um, incidents of antisocial behaviour. What I am intrigued about is how, why such a high percentage, seven, nearly 70% of them, fall foul when they've already been asked the question. Now, I do know that this is huge, it, you know, it calls on a huge amount of resources on the various agencies. It's not just the council and the landlord, it's the police are involved. But I, I really feel that we need more qualitative data on this. Why, when they've been asked questions, are they still falling foul uh, uh, to the extent that 70% uh, aren't looked into? Thank you. Um, so to answer your, your, your question, uh, councillor, I think um, there's a number of different um, reasons. Um, I think um, certainly we, we do understand um, that individuals who use the trigger, uh, like you say, potentially could be at the end of the tether and um, 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 uh, but unfortunately, I think there are um, certain individuals who who also see it as, as an opportunity to kind of use it as a complaints process. Um, and so unfortunately, if they don't meet the trigger, it, it's not designed to be kind of a, a, a complaint, you know, to circumnavigate um, a formal complaints process. So unfortunately, when you break down the trigger and the criteria, if, if you know, effectively, if they've got three reports in six months to either a police, a housing provider or the council, they that, that qualifies them for, um, uh, for, for for a panel in terms of an assessment and will come together to, to to obviously consider their case. I think what happens is people are aggrieved perhaps over previous years or things that they believe they've not got some resolution to, but doesn't fall within kind of that last last six months period. Um, and they do see it potentially as, uh, as an attempt to, to try and circumnavigate um, either responses they've had to the formal complaints process or just or not putting complaints in. Um, so um, unfortunately that is the case and we do try and make that clear in the process that is published on the council's website. Um, and like you say, the questions, if the individual does go through the online process, they are clear that, you know, in terms of the, the criteria that should be met, um, but, but, but unfortunately, um, on, on the vast majority, they, they don't. Uh, and like I say, I mean, it's, it's, it's three, it's three reports in six months. So, um, as long as that criteria is met, um, then the formal review will take place. Um, I, I just think, you know, for, for certain individuals, it, it is an attempt to, to, to try and circumnavigate and uh, perhaps, um, service they may not be happy with from a single agency perspective, but that isn't the role of the case review. The case review needs to look more at the multi-agency perspective and how we can collectively support when when the criteria has been met for a trigger. Thank you, uh, Raphael. And if we could now go over to Councillor Nick Peel. Thank you, Chair. It is um, getting on a bit, um, so I've, I've tried to be as brief as possible. I think there's perhaps been a bit of a <coughs> a potential breakdown in, in communications. Um, one of the, uh, and I, I want to start by saying um, the presentation is excellent. Um, we do have a, uh, a very, very good team at Community Safety who give the, that additional um, service to people of Bolton in addition to what the police do for us. But I think there's been a bit of uh, misunderstanding because the, the work programme uh, asked for um, the community safety presentation, but a, a couple of specific issues in relation to that. And that one was knife crime and one was nitrous oxide that Councillor Wright has just uh, written, uh, raised. Uh, and clearly that is not something that just community safety deal with because there's the partnership approach with trading standards. Um, one of the things, so I've got two specific questions here. Uh, firstly, on nitrous oxide, I think we need to congratulate the uh, the council uh, for seizing um, um, thousands of these um, in uh, well publicised press releases uh, in Bolton News and the Manchester Evening News. Uh, our executive member, Councillor Fairclough, quoted uh, in in both um, 
articles and also there's an article on the council website from August um, saying how the council has been seizing these um, uh, these uh, canisters and um, with our exact member promising more action. So congratulations uh, to the council needs to go on record there. Uh, I still do um, think that we uh, need a bit of a, you know, it's not a huge presentation, but of a bit of an update on the work on that. And secondly, um, the operation that, that was carried out by the police, um, just get back to my notes, Operation Sector, uh, which I raised um, with Rick Jackson and Stuart Ellison earlier on, need, needs to be commended. There is an issue of knife crime in Greater Manchester. It's not just a London and South issue. It's a GM issue and Superintendent Chris Downey himself said tackling knife crime remains a GM police priority. So I was very pleased to see uh, Operation Sept, which it, which included um, knife detectors. You get these kind of devices at train stations, etc. Um, weapon sweeps in known locations. Habitual knife carriers get visited. Schools get spoken to. But one of the things uh, that I was very interested in was shops were being visited by the police to check to test the knowledge of the staff. Now, this was this was the entire reason we put this on the agenda chair about trading standards, because trading standards does have the power to do this. Trading standards doesn't just do test purchases on cigarettes, alcohol and fireworks. It can also do test purchases on anything else that is illegal to sell to an under 18 year old or an under 16 year old, um, depending on, on, on the criteria. There is a range of other things such as um, games, violent games, um, for Xbox, etc., that um, that is illegal to sell to young people, and and I really do uh, would ask you, uh, because you have the authority to do this, that we do insist um, on getting trading trading standards here to address these issues that have risen, because I can't expect RAF and the community safety team to be able to address them fully. The executive member may, may want to speak on it, uh, but I think it's a bit of a a missed opportunity because there is clearly joined up working that does take place between trading standards and community safety. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, uh, Councillor Peel, uh, for that. And yes, it is on the committee work programme. I'm just going to go back to Vicky because at the beginning of the meeting, had you had some consultation with um, trading standards, Vicky? Thanks, Chair. Yeah, I did speak to um, Andy Boland from Trading Standards and it, it, he does really fall under the remit of the Police Scrutiny Committee. I can understand where members are coming from in terms of community safety and the working with the police, um, but I'm quite happy if the committee and the Chair do want me to ask Trading Standards to come along and just do a brief presentation to update members on where they're up to. Um, that'd be helpful because I remember at our, um, our work programme meeting, um, I did ask those questions whether those, whether these two issues, knife crime and the nitrous oxide canister issue, could be uh, discussed at this meeting. And uh, I remember, and I'm sure it's on the tape, that um, we were told, yes, they could be discussed at this meeting. And that's why they went on the work programme agenda. Um, so, yes, I would like um, uh, trading standards to um, report to us because it is on the uh, council website um, that an operation did take place in in August and uh, the executive cabinet member uh, Council Fairclough has got comments on the council uh, website and uh, a press release was sent to the Bolton News and uh, it's in the it's on, on the Bolton News website about the the operation that took place um, so I think at the next scrutiny committee meeting, we need to have this update from uh, trading standards on the nitrous oxide issue and um, on um, from what the police have, have been saying about knife crime. It certainly is an issue and Operation Scepter was a very important Greater Manchester wide operation and it, it, an operation here in the Bolton Borough. Uh, so um, yes, Councillor Peel, um, as chair, I will ask that um, we have an update from count, uh, trading standards at the next 
scrutiny committee meeting. Is that OK, Council Peel? Thanks, Joe. So now we'll go over to um, Councillor Madeline Murray, who wants to ask a question as well. Hopefully I'll come up. We can hear you, Councillor Murray. Oh, great stuff. Um, I'm, I'm not going to labour um, the question on uh, nitrous oxide um, in particular, except that it's uh, in my ward, I mean, it's for everybody's ward, but in my particular ward, it's uh, it's it's gone from uh, small silver canisters to very large blue ones. But um, I want to take this opportunity, and I don't want to sound like a creep, but um, I want to thank RAF's officers um, for coming out on loads of occasions to help us in the community when this antisocial behaviour uh, uh, rears its head and uh, people get a bit scared when these young people who've been uh, sniffing this stuff uh, start being daft and, um, and, and sometimes threatening and harassing. But I hope he takes back to his staff, uh, particularly our thanks in Great Lever, uh, for uh, they just drop everything his office uh, RAF's officers so I just hope he takes that back thank you thank you uh, Councillor Murray so uh, RAF uh, do take those comments back to your officers you've got a tremendous team there um, no other members have indicated to speak but if any member wishes to ask a question could you just unmute now if you want to ask a question and come in OK, no members have uh, indicated or unmuted. So can I thank you, Raf, for the excellent presentation that you've made uh, this evening? And please take those comments back to your um, team of officers as well, please. So we'll continue on the agenda and we go up to uh, item 9A, which is members' questions. Any members' questions, Vicky? No, Chair, I haven't received anything. Thank you. So we go to item 9B. Now these are extracts of decisions arising from the minutes of other meetings relevant to the remit of this committee. And uh, in advance of this meeting and by email, members were forwarded cabinet minutes held on the 2nd and 30th of November 2020. Executive cabinet members leaders portfolio held on the 3rd of November and 1st of December 2020 and also Executive Cabinet Member Stronger Communities Portfolio held on the 3rd of November 2020. Has any member got a question on any of those minutes at all? Just unmute now if you have. So I think we can take those minutes um, as um, OK with everybody. So therefore, with that means we've come to the end of tonight's scrutiny committee meeting. So uh, first of all, I want to thank our council officers for answering all of the questions from members and also to our senior police officers who joined us this evening as well. So thank you to all for your presentations and answering our questions. I want to thank Vicky, our committee admin clerk, and uh, John, who is our technical officer for running this meeting, to members as well for the attending and asking all the questions, and to the public at home, if you're watching this meeting live or on the council's YouTube channel, the recorded version. So it remains for me to say, I wish everybody a very happy Christmas. Let 2021 be a year of hope and optimism and we'll meet again next year. Good evening, everyone. Thank you, Chair. Good night. Thank you. Good night. Good night, Good night Chair. Christmas, Thank everyone. You. Thank you.